So let's uh, thank him and, and pray for this time together. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be in your presence. There's nowhere that we can go, that we can run from your presence. But you have gathered your people here. And the purpose of this gathering is to lift up your name, to sing praise to you, to read scripture to you, uh, to pray to you to hear from you. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our minds and our hearts. Lord, I thank you for the technology we have, that this can be broadcast to those that maybe cannot be here with us in person and, and are watching uh, wherever they are and maybe watching later on. I pray that those uh, technical signals would stay strong and everything would work as it is supposed to. Thank you, Lord. We come before you to give you worship. We love you, we praise you, we desperately need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 31. I invite you to stand. Aaron is the lay reader. He's going to lead us in that. And let's be called to worship from God's word. Please join with me. In you, O oh Lord, do I take my refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have made in the corner, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O oh Lord, faithful my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Please greet one another in the name of the Lord as we get ready to sing the praise. Good morning in the name of the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. 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 Four. Maybe we're all Good morning. 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 Good
I need to get another hug. <laughs> I miss you guys. Hey, so I looked up the address from my Google Maps. You're in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I'll come here tonight. Yeah. It was a cornfield at one time. <laughs> they bought the... Uh, they bought. They had ten acres, and then they bought the forty acres on the other side of the creek, which they still plant. But, and he moved his business over to All right. that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give you better directions.
please join with me in the corporate prayer of confession. Holy, holy, holy God, please have mercy on us sinful people. We confess we often sin against you, God, order, and deed, both collectively and individually. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers our sins and makes us able to come boldly to you for forgiveness, grace, and your mercy. Help us to respond by living for you daily in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. What amazing grace this is, that I am forgiven because Jesus Christ was forsaken. His amazing love has indeed broken my chains. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In Christ, you are forgiven and free. All in Christ are forgiven and free. Let us live in Christ, proclaiming, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Let all those living in crowd, Christ shout, Amen. 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 Well, no. the, the greatest thing that showed us God's love. Who 
showed us God's love? It was somebody that didn't. Jesus showed us God's love when he died on the cross. When he died on the cross. And he rose again. And he rose again. Yeah. And now he's he's at the right hand of the Father. And as we trust in him, he sends he his Holy Spirit. And he sends the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. You guys remember that? Yeah. Very good today. Who made you? God. God. What else did he make? Everything. And why did he make you and everything else? For God's glory. Awesome. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much uh, for the attention of these kids. Lord, they, they know these verses. And I pray that they would know them deep in their hearts. And I pray that we would know them deep in our hearts. That you, your love is overflowing to us. And the greatest, the greatest thing that showed us that was Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. Help them to know that now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Jane's got the gifts and bits and hats. glass of water, please. <laughs> Thank you. We are making our way through uh, Revelation, slowly but surely. <clears throat> so I would invite you today to turn to chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 29, Revelation chapter 2, 18 through 29. Before we read it, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, what great, uh, what great songs we've sung this morning. How great is the Lord our God. My chains are gone. Been set free. Not because of something I could do, but because of Jesus' love and his life and death and resurrection. That, that lavish love upon us, Lord. Thank you so much. Now I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, from your word. The Holy Spirit that, that helped him give the vision to John and inspired him to write it down, Lord. That same Holy Spirit, I pray, would speak to our hearts, would speak to our minds. That would draw us closer to you, Lord. That we would be people that, that stand up and, and don't compromise. But we're able to lovingly speak truth and love. I do pray the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are my rock. You are my redeemer. Speak to your people from your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Thank you. I forgot. What's that? She lavished it on you. She lavished it on you. Hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike your children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have 
until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to start this morning in a very unusual way. I want to start by talking about Asaph. Who is Asaph? Well, Asaph is one who, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote a number of the Psalms. We learn in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4, that he was appointed by David to lead the worship. It says, then he, David, appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief. And then it goes on to say this. Asaph was to sound the cymbals. And Benaiah and Jehaziah, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the ark of the covenant of God. Then on that day, David first appointed with thanksgiving, first appointed that thanksgiving to be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. So in our terms today, Asaph would be a, a worship leader a praise team leader, a, a music leader. He is to lead the people to thank and praise the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 29.30, he's listed as a seer, S-E-E-R, or a prophet. So this chief Levite worship leader, this prophet, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote a number of psalms. Now, you might already be thinking, Pastor Jefferson, I thought this was going to be about Revelation. Well, it is. But I'm bringing up Asaph because inspired by the Holy Spirit, he gives us one of the most honest, we like to use the word transparent a lot these days. You can see, you can feel what he's thinking of. The most honest, transparent looks at the temptations of the Christian life. And he does that in Psalm 73. Listen to what he says. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. And then listen to the rhetorical questions he asks. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Wow. Psalm 73, Asaph, a follower of God, is basically, in a nutshell, saying, am I doing this in vain? I look around and things seem to be going pretty well for the wicked. I follow God and all I get is grief. Have I done this in vain? As you read Psalm 73, and I encourage you to do that, you will see that, that he goes into the sanctuary, and you might say, in a sense, he comes to his senses. And then he says this, Yet I still belong to you. You, God, hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail my spirit grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is forever. He is mine forever. Well, now you still might be thinking, okay, Pastor Jefferson, thanks for the lesson about Asaph. What about Revelation? What does that have to do with Revelation? <clears throat> the letter to Thyatira is a letter to a church that is struggling 
with compromise with the surrounding culture. It's a letter to a culture much like ours. And the risen, exalted Lord Jesus Christ is pointing Thyatira back to himself. And in a sense, he's saying, be like Asaph. Don't envy the proud. Don't join in the culture around you. Don't think that you're following me in vain. Jesus says to them, I will hold your right hand. I will be the strength of your heart. Stay with me. The message I believe he has for us from this scripture today is that we would learn from Thyatira to keep growing in Christ and holding on to him until he comes again. May we learn from Thyatira to keep growing in Christ and holding on to him until he comes again. Thyatira was a city that is located in what is today Akisar, Turkey. Now, in the past letters, we've been talking about these big cosmopolitan cities. We've been talking about Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamon. And they're like the, the New York and the Washington, D.C., the, the seats of culture and religion and politics. Thyatira is more the Aliquippa or Youngstown. It's where things are made. It's where the factories are. And with those workings, those products, there are what you might call unions or guilds. We know that there was clothing guilds, bakery, cobblers, tanners, dyers. Probably their most famous product was a purple dye. And I read this and I learned this. It was very interesting. We would call it turkey red, but they call it purple, and it's from brewing the root of the matter uh, plant, M-A-D-D-E-R. You can go online, you can Google dying with the matter root, and you can do it this afternoon. Still done today. Well, if you were a baker, or you worked in the clothing factory, or a tanner, or a dry, uh, um, a dyer, whatever it was, the guild that oversaw you would be connected to a god or a goddess. So participating in that guild meant that you would go to the temple and you would eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. And then you would participate in very deviant sexual immorality. And you would do so in the name of paying homage or worship to whichever god or goddess your guild was connected with. The scholar Simon Kistemaker says, Christians who refuse to honor pagan gods, eat meat sacrificed to an idol, and engage in sexual immorality, jeopardize their material necessities. They were regarded as outcasts of society. So somehow into that context, a church of Jesus Christ is alive. And it's a church that's doing really well. Listen to how Jesus starts this in verse 19. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Wow, that sounds pretty good. One of the commentators I read with the last name Phillips, he says this, here is the kind of church we should want to be part of. And I agree. He said, I know your love. Well, they're doing what Paul said. Paul said, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Jesus commends them. You're doing a great job. He commends them on their faith. He commends them on their service. They're so in love with the Lord that they are serving others out of that love. They're persevering. They're keeping at it. And they're growing. You are now doing more than you did at first. This is actually the opposite of the letter to Ephesus. Remember the letter to Ephesus? He told them, do the works you did at first. Jesus commends Thyatira here saying, you have kept growing. You're doing what Peter wrote 
In 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. He says, you are doing all these things. I commend you. Things are flowing along very well. But, Apparently within the congregation, there's a few that are like Asaph. They look around, they see their buddies in the bakery guild, and they think, he's living a painless life. Body's healthy and strong. Don't have troubles like other people, not plagued with problems. That's everything his heart could ever wish for. Some of them are thinking this, and someone in the church says to them, you know, you're right. Let's go ahead and join in. It's all good. It doesn't matter. That someone that was saying that was Jezebel. They were tolerating Jezebel. Verse 20. Nevertheless, all these things going on very good, and I commend you for it. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teachings, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So when we hear that word Jezebel, it takes us back to the Old Testament wife of King Ahab. Let me read to you from 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Jezebel led King Ahab, who was already wicked and not following the Lord, even more grossly into wickedness and idol worship. Worshipping Baal, worshipping Asherah. And throughout time, Jezebel became a name synonymous with rebellion toward God disobedience toward God, wickedness, evil, and idolatry. So it's possible that in Thyatira there was a woman actually named Jezebel. It's possible that there was a woman who's being symbolized by Jezebel. It's possible that there's several people that are promoting what I've called the Jezebel spirit. And what I mean by that is a spirit of disobedience against the Lord. Saying, I, I don't care about you, Lord, and I don't care about your word. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And the risen, exalted Jesus tells the church, you're tolerating Jezebel, misleading my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. They're compromising with the culture around them. Unlike Asaph, they not only envied the wicked and thought, maybe I'm doing something in vain, they joined in with the wicked. The problem with that is the church of Jesus Christ is called to holiness. Hebrews 12:14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Thyatira was doing all this great thing, but by tolerating some that had this Jezebel spirit, they're starting to look just like the culture around us. And the church is not supposed to look like the culture around us. The church is supposed to be different. Jesus says, by tolerating, and I looked up that Greek word, it means permitting, allowing, not hindering. By permitting Jezebel to influence the congregation, you're doing what you're not supposed to do. And there is great judgment as you read through this letter to Thyatira. I believe this is a major struggle 
in our day. Now, thankfully, it's not to the point yet where to be a good participant in society, you have to eat food sacrificed to idols, to idols and go to a temple where you there perform sexual immorality acts. But it certainly is in our culture about sexual immorality. It certainly is about following the God of this age. And the God of this age, we are told by the culture around us, is you. You. You are the arbiter of truth. You are your own God. You decide what you want to be and what you want to do. You make everyone else follow what you want to do. And you and I both know that sadly there are many churches that tolerate the Jezebel spirit. That say, yes, we know the scripture says this, but that's an old antiquated book that, that we don't believe anymore. You decide what you want to do. We're with you. We champion you. We walk alongside with you. Don't worry about what that ancient text says. You want to worship Jesus and other gods? Go ahead. I remember a long time ago talking with a college student. And he was going to a college that was associated with one of the largest denominations at the time. So it had Christian roots. And we were talking about sharing our, our faith. And, and I remember he said something to the effect to me of, well, you know, I don't really want to share my faith because we're not supposed to push our religion on it. That's what he was being taught at the church-related school, is we don't push our religion on anybody. We let everybody do whatever everybody wants. Now, to an extent, he's correct. We should never be pushing our faith on anyone. If we're pushing our faith, we are wrong. But we are called to proclaim. We're called to make disciples. And if we're called to make disciples, that means sometimes people will convert from this faith to following the Lord. They will convert. They will have grown up as a Muslim, and they will convert to the Lord Jesus. They will have grown up as a Hindu, or grown up as someone who didn't believe in God at all, and they will convert, and they will follow the Lord Jesus. Our churches cannot tolerate the Jezebel spirit. We are not God. We do not determine reality. God does, and God has. So, you might ask the question, what should our church do to remain faithful? What should I as an individual do to remain faithful? Verse 25, only hold on to what you have until I come. Well, this is a long letter, and I'm not getting through every part of it today. I've skipped some. But in a nutshell, in verse 18, Jesus is described as the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. He is the judge. He can see. He can judge. He can crushed with those feet. And this, the, the letter tells us he will judge those who are misleading others and those who follow them. Going back to Asaph, those who plunge into wickedness because it is easier will be judged and they will be judged harshly. So how do we not tolerate this Jezebel spirit? How do we remain faithful? Only hold on to what you have until I come. In other words, follow the consistent teaching of the New Testament. Paul, Ephesians 6, we read this in the guys' Sunday school today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, 
and having done all to stand firm. Then there's Jude. Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, appealing you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Hold on to what you have until I come. And then there's what Paul told young Timothy, the young pastor, in 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Stand fast in the faith. Or, in the words of Asaph, daily recognize that the Lord Jesus holds your right hand. That your health may fail, your spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of our heart. And he is ours forever. Stand fast in the faith by being connected to the Lord Jesus Christ recognizing that he is the one doing all the work and getting the glory. And do this until he comes again. Until we stop breathing and our bodies go in the ground and our spirit goes to be with him. Or until he comes again. Stand fast in the faith. So what, Pastor? This letter to Thyatira is all about not compromising with the world. Churches that tolerate the Jezebel spirit, they compromise. And here's the problem. They don't have any real answers for people who need them. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I want to close by, by showing you a, about a three-minute clip. It's from the TV show ER. It's one of the most incredible pictures I've ever seen, and frankly, I'm not sure how it got passed through Hollywood. The episode itself is literally labeled or called Atonement. What you're about to watch, the character in the bed in the hospital, that character is a doctor who had worked in a prison. And that doctor had lethally injected a person that he later found out was innocent and had been framed of his crime. He's speaking with a, a chaplain, and, and certainly I don't want to say <clears throat> that all chaplains are bad, but this one is kind of stereotypical. A stereotypical chaplain, um, hospital chaplain, who compromises with the world, world, who won't say, yes, this Bible is the answer. Jesus is what you need. This chaplain is sort of wishy-washy and doesn't have anything to offer to the patient. All she has is what he calls your questions and uncertainties. With that in mind, watch this clip. Uh, Twenty-six year old kid on the table, convicted of killing a cop. See his family bleeding, praying. I injected the drugs, and he didn't die. He lay in there, awake, quivering, lethal doses of three different agents, and he was still alive. Parents were crying, playing a miracle. What happened? The IV infiltrated. The drugs pooled in his soft tissues instead of going to do his bloodstream. So I placed another IV, drew up another round of meds, and pushed. And this time, I took him 90 seconds to die. Two months later, a police officer came forward. The boy was framed for the murder. 
He didn't do it. You couldn't have known that. God tried to stop me from killing an innocent man and I ignored the sign. How can I even hope for forgiveness? I think sometimes it's easier to feel guilty than forgiven. Which means what? That maybe your guilt over these deaths has become your reason for living. Maybe you need a new reason to go on. I, I, I don't want to go on. Can't you see I'm old? I have cancer. I've had enough. The only thing that is holding me back is that I am afraid. I'm afraid of what comes next. What do you think that is? Oh, you tell me. Is it totally even possible? What does God want from me? I think it's up to each one of us to interpret what God wants. So people can do anything? They can rape, they can murder, they can steal all the name of God, it's okay? No, that's not what I'm saying. Well, what are you saying? Because all I'm hearing is some new age, God is love, one size fits all crap. Hey, Dr. Schumer. No, I don't have time for this now. Right, it's okay. I understand. No, you don't understand. You don't understand. How can you possibly say that and listen to me? I want a real chaplain who believes in a real God and a real hell. I hear that you're frustrated, but you need to ask yourself. No, I don't need to ask myself. I need answers. And all your questions and your uncertainty are only making things worse. I know you're upset. God, I need someone who will look me in the eye and tell me how to find forgiveness because I am running out of time. I'm trying to help. Well, don't! Just get out! Get out! Get out! Julia, come on. Listen, come on. Come on, the guy's just freaking out. He didn't mean what he said. Yeah, he did. He absolutely did. How'd they hit that on the head? I'm running out of time. I need someone to look me in the eye and tell me how I can be forgiven. And if she came from a, a, a background of believing God's word, and seeking to honor the Lord, she could have said, let me tell you. Let me tell you about the God that died for you. But instead, in the spirit of Jezebel, compromise, everything's okay, all faces are the same. She just has nothing that gives him any kind of hope. May we stand fast in the faith. Like Asaph, May we recognize that Jesus' right hand holds us. That he will guide us, leading us to a glorious destiny. That may we desire nothing on earth above him. And may we recognize that our health and our, our spirit might grow weak. But he remains the strength of our heart. And he is with us forever. May we learn from Thyatira to keep growing in Christ, holding on to him until he comes again. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have hope. We have hope. We can be forgiven. We can know you because of your son, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I pray that that would be proclaimed. This is just a Hollywood character on the screen, but in such a real situation, Lord, where people are asking, how, how can I be forgiven? How can I, how can I know what's going on? And, Lord, the answer is that you forgive. And you have called us to stand up and preach that message. 
not some watered down message of you decide what you want God to do and you be the one in charge of everything. So Lord, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that as a church, we would not compromise with the culture. And I pray that as individuals in our lives, we would not compromise with the culture. And if there are ways which we have, Lord, that we would come back to you. Come back to you. Receive your mercy and grace and forgiveness. Lord, if there's anybody here or watching online that, that has never known about a relationship with you, maybe you're an, an object or a, just a noun or a name, I pray that today would be the day of salvation when they would hear the message of repent, turn from our sin, turn toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and be in a relationship with you where we are then your sons and your daughters, that we can cast our cares upon you, and you will send your Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. Lord, for those that have understood that and have been walking with you for so long, Lord, the temptations are out there to compromise. We talked about in Sunday school how we have an opponent, a devil, that's like a lion seeking to devour. So help us to daily remember ASAP that your hand holds us. Let us abide in you. Let us dress in your armor on a daily basis and give you all the praise and all the glory. And may we never stop growing more and more into your image until you come again. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We respond to God's word today by coming to uh, his table. And this is his table. This is not the Hanover Presbyterian Church table. It's not the Evangelical Presbyterian Church's table. It is the Lord's table. And all are invited to come to this table as long as they come in faith, repentance, and love. Scriptures do tell us to, to discern our hearts, to check our hearts. If we're living in sin, we need to confess it and, and be forgiven and come forward and receive mercy and grace. You've heard me say a million times, but it's like that, that, that Kenny Wood arrow. That Kenny Wood arrow is not the reality of Kenny Wood. It points us to the reality of Kenny Wood. This points us to the reality of Something we can't fully understand. Communion with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Communion with one another. Communion with brothers and sisters around the globe. Communion with that great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. So come to this table and receive the bread of life. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come to this table. May we never take it for granted. As we eat the bread this morning, as we drink the cup, as we smell the bread and, and the juice, as we touch it, as we taste it, may we be thankful for these sensible signs that are the arrow pointing to the reality of this communion with you. A reality that we have now and that, that will go on for eternity. So thank you. You said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let us feast upon you this morning. Let us run to your table. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would invite some elders to come forward. As they pass out the bread, hold on to it. Then they'll pass the juice. Hold on to it. We will take everything together. <coughs>
eat this in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. Likewise, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. Let's stand and sing. In Christ alone. to the Lord, uh, but I would ask you all to pray for John McCoy. Uh, he was in the hospital for a little bit this past week. Uh, he is home, praise God for that, but if he would be uh, pray, praying for John. And then the other thing is that I will not make her come up front. This is our last Sunday um, before Lily moves away from us all. And uh, she doesn't know this yet, but there's cake to celebrate with you afterwards. And uh, I'm going to take a moment. Like I said, I won't make you come up front because I know you hate that. But during the prayer time, I want to pray specifically for you. We thank God for your um, being a part of life. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for the singing. Thank you that Christ alone is our salvation. If it was left up to us, then Lord, we would, we would not be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you that you love us. And not only uh, do you save us, but then you call us your sons and daughters and tell us we can cast our cares upon you. So I do lift up John to you, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would strengthen him, give wisdom to the doctors and nurses to 
uh, know what's going on and to help him be with those that are caring for him. Lord, I thank you for his whole family. I lift up Bob to you as well. I lift up Penny Kramer, Lord, that you would continue to be working in her life, and I thank you for her. We lift up the nursing home that, that we will visit this afternoon where Mitzi is. We lift up Betty Hope. We thank you for hearing our prayers. Now would you hear from your people any praises or concerns that they would like to mention out loud? Lord, we sometimes hold things in and don't mention them out loud, but you know what they are. Father God, I thank you for a gift to this congregation, and that gift is Lillian King. Uh, Lord, uh, I thank you and praise you for her, for Harry. Uh, Lord, the generosity that, that is shown through her out of love for you. The way that she has grown, always coming to Sunday school Bible studies and, and learning and growing, Lord. Thank you. And I'm sure, Lord, that, that she's probably got some, some uh, mixed emotions, excited about the future, but, uh, but uh, leaving a place where she's known for a long time. So, Lord, in, in the Deep parts of her being, Lord, I ask for your mercy and grace and patience and joy. Thank you uh, that, that she got to be part of this congregation uh, for a long time. And Lord, let her know that, that we love her, um, but you love her infinitely more. So thank you. I pray for her and carry both, Lord, to, to know you, to seek you, and to uh, follow you. And uh, thank you that... Uh, there will be times of visitation, and, and uh, we can use the technology and the, the things available to us to keep in contact. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We can't do anything without you. And we come to you now praying the prayer that you taught us. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We respond to God's word by giving of our time, our abilities, and the resources He's given us in the first place. So I would invite the ushers to come forward and receive. The tithes and offerings given.
Amen. You may be seated. Quickly, some announcements. Please join us for the fellowship time afterwards and, and say goodbye to Lillian. Um, she'll be back. She'll, she'll be back to visit. Um, <clears throat> no Bible study uh, this week or the two weeks after it. I'm away. Uh, tomorrow through Wednesday, I'll be at the Basics Conference outside of, of Cleveland. Um, so be aware of, of that. No Bible study. We are going to the nursing home this afternoon at 3. All are welcome to do that. The men are making breakfast for the women. We didn't forget this year. We're making breakfast uh, next week. So guys, if, if you want to be part of that, the ones that are supposed to bring something, I think know who you are. Uh, but we're going to meet at 8.30 to get breakfast going. Breakfast starts at 9.30 next Sunday on Mother's Day. Uh, we've been receiving a good number of water bottles. Thank you. Uh, we still need some more to get as many as we would like to pass out during the, the whole parade route. But thank you. Um, anybody want to make any mention about the ladies' tea? Anybody? Okay. Ladies' tea is coming up. Uh, Lillian's address, if it's not on the bulletin board yet, we will get it out there so you can correspond with that. The last announcement I have is that Vacation Bible School is going to happen this year at Mill Creek, and it's going to be in the evenings. Um, it's different than how we've done it the last few years, but we've done it in the evening before. Um, and it's going to be Sunday through Thursday. So it's going to start on Sunday, uh, June 25th, and go through Thursday the 29th from 6 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. So if you would like to help with that, we could use as many people as possible to help. Even if it's, maybe you say, oh, I can't do one day. That's okay. Let me know, and I'll get the word. Tracy Heinlein is the one over at Mill Creek that is, is coordinating it and directing it, and I'll get her the information. It's the Keepers of the Kingdom curriculum, so we will be in the medieval times, and it uh, will be a good uh, week of amazing learning and growing in Christ. Any other announcements? Okay. Right. Do you have any announcements? Thank you all for helping me. It's been going for a while. Thank you to everybody that uh, that contributed. Mm -hmm. um, he received everything he needed. Thank you. I just was looking at the two opportunities to help, and just a reminder that next week is the Walk for Life and the Walk for Child Evangelism Fellowship. So if you want to sponsor someone, now's a chance. Now's a chance. Our team is fourth. The Hanover team is fourth on the support list. Um, but we want to just get as much support for choices as we can. And for Child Evangelism Fellowship. All right. The closing hymn, I'm going to remind you to treat the closing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the closing hymn is uh, an old one that I've never heard before. Um, I think it should be in more hymn books. It's called No Compromise. You've got a copy of the notes. It'll be up here on the screen. Let's stand and sing it as well as we can.
alone on the word of God, as the song P-I-B-L-E goes. And may we continue to keep growing in our faith. Always. Don't forget to enjoy some cake and fellowship afterwards and now receive the benediction. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Amen.